Okay. Well, um, hello everyone, and welcome again for this session of the Pari Center's online summer series, exploring the life and work of David Bohm. I'm uh, James G. Barbieri, for people who don't know me. Um, yeah. I'm a member of the board of directors at the Pari Center, and I will be your host today. Uh, today with me, we also have Eleanor Pete and uh, who is uh, the program director of the Forest Center and Maureen Doolan, who is the co-founder of the Forest Center. Uh, they will be basically behind the scenes ensuring that everything uh, runs smoothly. Uh, before we begin, I'll just remind everyone of the uh, Zoom rules for this session. Um, during the presentation, we ask the participants to turn off their microphone to ensure a better quality audio. Um, for this reason, we might mute you um, if we hear some background noise, but this is not, it's nothing personal. It's just to, uh, you know, to ensure a good um, audio quality. Uh, we also invite all participants to uh, turn on their camera um, as we believe that seeing as everyone's faces, everyone's reactions creates a nice inclusive environment. Um, one thing I need to note is that all sessions will be recorded for archival purposes. Uh, the recordings will not include the possible breakout room discussions, but it will include the speaker's presentation, follow-up discussion, and Q&A. Um, these recordings are available to anyone who has purchased a ticket for the session or for sessions that uh, people have paid but were unable to attend. Now, today's session will be structured similar to yesterday's uh, session. Uh, well, basically, we will all, it'll be um, a presentation divided in three parts, and we'll have the um, Q&A and discussion in, in between. Um, now, I'll uh, just introduce today's speaker, Pavel Pilkanen. Uh, today, the Party Center Summer Series extends a very warm welcome to Pavel. Pavel is a long-term friend of David Pete the Pete family, and the Pari Center. He's been to Pari many times, and our audiences have always been fascinated by what he has to say. Uh, Pavel is a senior lecturer in theoretical philosophy at Helsinki University in Finland. His uh, main research areas are philosophy of mind, philosophy of physics, and their intersections. He has, in particular, been inspired by David Bohm and Basil Haile's interpretation of quantum theory and has collaborated with both of them on several occasions. In his 2007 book, Mind, Matter, and the Implicate Order, he proposed that Bohmian notions, such as active information and implicate order, can provide new ways of approaching key problems in philosophy of mind, such as mental causation and time and consciousness. Today, Pavel is going to address the topic of quantum reality and consciousness. Welcome, Pavel. Thank you very much for those kinds of words and very nice uh, being here. I'm in uh, Helsinki at the moment. We, we have actually a hot day today. It hasn't been like that, but uh, and I'm just back to Helsinki from our little summer, summer house uh, with the family. So, so, uh, so it's always a bit of a Bit of a hassle, hassle here, but anyway, here, here we go. And, and so uh, what I thought I, I could do here is uh, to talk about some of the early, very early work of Bohm, which is perhaps not so familiar to, to, to everybody. And then we could just have a, uh, a free dis discussion and interaction. So I don't know if I do it in three parts. I mean, we could break up for, for questions. I could maybe stop uh, after a while, and uh, you know, just ask if people want to want to uh, discuss and and. Uh, but but anyway, so I, I thought I'll 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 uh, I'll do it like that. And I guess the idea there is that there's a lot of work today going under the label of uh, known as quantum cognition. Also, a lot of mathematical work. And interestingly, David Bohm anticipated a lot of the, if you like, the basic ideas of that work already in his 1951 book. So that's, that I think has been quite interesting. And, and so, so that's what I thought I could talk here in the beginning. And I'll see if I can share my screen. Now, let me see. How does it work? And when I do that, what do you see? Yes, we see. <laughs> it works. Does yeah. it? Okay, good. 
Okay, so, uh, and anyway, there's, you can see my email there. So if people want, you know, if they're interested, I have many of the articles in uh, PDF and things like that. So you can write me an email. <clears throat> also, if you, you know, if there are questions that, that didn't discuss. So, uh, and, and so uh, the, uh, and we could start from a noting that that the um, there's kind of a proposal maybe over the past 10 20 years the the proposal has been that quantum probability models cognition correctly so i won't be talking so much about consciousness as conscious experience today but more more about more broadly about thought thought and cognition but of course in some ways that's included in in this term and we have, for example, researchers like Emmanuel Pothos and Jerome Busemeyer. Uh, they actually published this article, which you can see in, in this was this is a leading article in, uh, you know, this kind of cognitive neuroscience philosophy. This is this is a journal, sorry, leading journal, behavioral and brain sciences. That's where you publish Searle's Chinese Room, many other, you know, Bennett's work. So it's just partly to show you that this type of thinking has made a kind of breakthrough to the mainstream journal. Whether that's good or not, okay, we, <laughs> but I just mentioned that. And, and so, uh, and this is already like, you know, seven, year, seven years ago. Now, what they're saying is that when they do this empirical work in, in psychology connected to uh, human decision-making and, and judgment, and they claim that what they call quantum probability theory can actually account for these results, uh, while classical base and probability theory fails. And, and so the claim in this program is that there's a large class of cognitive processes which, which, uh, where you could actually use quantum concepts such as entanglement and complementarity to provide explanations. And, and the... Uh, Maybe I'll, I could mention one example is, is uh, where, they, where they do this is uh, that for, you know, when, when you do an experiment to people and you ask about the honesty of, of American presidents, I mean, this, was, this is before Donald Trump, so this is about Gore and Clinton. And what happens is that if you first ask, ask about Gore and only afterwards about Clinton, both of them get better results. If you start with Clinton and then go to Gore, then, both of them will get worse results. This is called order effects, which says that even in psychological experiments, the order in which you do your uh, measurement, if you like, will influence uh, uh, the outcome. And the idea here, the analogy to the quantum mechanics is here that if you first measure position and then momentum, it typically will be different if you do it vice versa. This just to give you a little simple example, but these are the sorts of things that these people have done huge amounts. But of course, now suppose it's correct uh, that these quantum approaches would be successful. We can always wonder why. Now, one suggestion here is that there are what you might call deep structural analogies between thought and, and quantum phenomena. And the, this is something where, which you actually find then in, or what Bohm did already in, this was in his textbook, Quantum Theory, back in 1951. So he, he actually discusses in a few pages, these kinds of analogies, which is sort of a nice thing to do in a textbook, which usually tends to be, you know, they perhaps tend to be less included in philosophical discussion, but there's a lot of philosophical discussion in this, uh, this Quantum Theory book. So, uh, okay, so in this, what I'll do now here, just to give you a bit of a overview is of what I was saying. So on the one hand, we'll consider whether these quantum approaches or quantum ideas might help us to understand cognition better. That's in a way what these people are doing in, in, in this quantum cognition field. But there's also a more radical idea, which I think Bohm, uh, also mentions in his book and which I kind of kind of discovered from there and, and expanded a little bit in my some of my own work that it could also be that 
our, our familiarity with our own thought processes might actually provide a key to a better understanding of quantum theory. So this is interesting. I, I'll say a bit about that towards the end, but uh, uh, this is philosophically an interesting point, how, how uh, <clears throat> understanding here could work both ways, if you like. It's not only that quantum theory might help us to understand the mind, but it could be also vice versa. Okay, just a little bit about this quantum cognition. So it's a bit of a tutorial here, but just a, in case people are not familiar with this. Um, so uh, this, is, this is something that I already mentioned. So it's just repeating the point about the claim by this Potos and Bosemeyer that that this, uh, there's something interesting here in terms of the success of qu quantum probability. And so, so this human judgment and <clears throat> preference often display order and complex effects. The thing about Gore and Clinton is one, it's an example of an order effect. There's also something known as a violation of the law of total probability and failures of compos compositionality. I won't go into these things, I, but I'll, you know, you'll find the reference if you want to study these things. So uh, <clears throat> this is where, these are the sort of things where quantum probability works. And, and what the questions for these people is, is the, uh, again, that do we get unique insights and predictions regarding cognition? And they're all also interested in, the nature of human rationality. So whether, whether, because in some of these experiments, what, what, it, what they actually show, it, it looks as if people are being irrational. And, and maybe these, what these, you know, Paltus and Busemeyer are suggesting that they're perhaps being rational in, in another way that we are, we are used to because they are obeying these laws of quantum probability. One thing to realize here is that uh, people like Pothos and Busemar, but also many other people here in this quantum cognition field, they're not discussing the application of quantum physics to brain physiology. Because they see this, you know, this is the sort of thing that especially people like Penrose and Hameroff uh, are interested in. And, but also David Bohm at various, you know, parts of his, his career, he, he speculated about these sorts of things. Uh, these quantum cognition people, they, they see this as a controversial issue about which they are agnostic. And they are interested more in this quantum probability as a mathematical framework for cognitive modeling. Pro potentially relevant in any behavioral situation, which involves uncertainty. I think one could put here a little footnote because I've been in some of the conferences with these people and after enough number of uh, glasses of wine, they will confess that they would be very disappointed if there's nothing in brain physiology that would explain, you know, some of these interesting things. But of course, you know, they just don't put it into the papers because then they wouldn't get them published in behavioral and brain science. Anyway, and I guess they just want to, in some ways, this work is not so speculative because, you know, if it works, if, if this mathematics works there, then, you know, that's, that's a valid result, regardless of whether or not there is any underlying physical reason for it. So, you know, one, you know I, one can understand the strategy as well. And, and so, uh, again, what, what one means about this quantum probability theory, they see that as a formal framework for assigning probabilities to events which then can be distinguished from quantum mechanic, which is, which is a theory of physical phenomena. And, and so for example, Potos and Busemeyer, they think that this quantum probability theory would be the abstract foundation of uh, quantum mechanics, not specifically tied to physics. Okay. And, and so, uh, so it's, it's <clears throat> the idea is that you could then try to apply this quantum probability theory to any science where there's a need to formalize uncertainty. So people have done applications in economics and information theory. Okay. And of course, when, 
I could ask you, so what, what are those features of quantum theory which make it the promising framework for understanding cognition? So they would be for, for offering things like uh, superposition and entanglement, incompatibility and interference. Uh, I give here also reference to uh, Atmas Bahar and colleagues, something they call weak quantum theory. Weak here means that it's some, it's not, you know, it's weak in the sense that you can apply it in many different domains, not just in, in, in the quantum physics. Now, again, we could come back to the question that, that which still may be puzzling us that, uh, suppose that there is, you know, it's correct that these models are very successful. We could still ask, well, how can it be that quantum physics, it was developed to account for quantum physical phenomena. So how, how could it possibly be able to account for cognitive phenomena? And I think the explanation people like Pothos and Busamori, they just say that, you know, that it's because there's an analogy. Some cognitive phenomena are analogous to quantum phenomena. But they leave it at that, as, as we mentioned. Now, Let's, let's then get to <clears throat> David Bohm. And uh, Bohm acknowledges that he's been in, he was inspired by Niels Bohr uh, in, in this line of thought. And, and so, uh, and what I think what is remarkable in, in those few pages in Bohm that he, not only does he describe those analogies, but he also tries to explain them. He sort of speculates about, about why, why they might hold. And I have an article referenced there. With, this is also open access, so you can, you can find that easily. Website. Now, one thing for people, I think you've already heard many lectures about Bohm, so you, you, you maybe are familiar with but just to remind you that in this 1951 textbook, uh, Bohm is using a version of the Copenhagen interpretation. So this is before he came up with his so-called, you know, this hidden variables approach or ontological interpretation or causal interpretation, whatever you want to call it. And, and so uh, I think Bohm himself, I think in the 50s, he thought he was representing the Niels Bohr point of view, but he later on, I think he discusses it with Wilkins, Maurice Wilkins, that he, Bohm's view was actually quite close to Wolfgang Pauli's way of thinking about uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, one philosophically interesting point here is that the way for he would characterize a quantum system in terms of incompatible potentialities. So rather than saying that the electron is an actual object waiting to be measured, we should think of think of it more in terms of uh, some sort of potentialities and also not just that there you know the entire object is potentially there and we we would explicate it but rather you can I, let's you can either measure position or momentum but not both simultaneously and that's why they are kind of incompatible this is of course the notion of complementarity in there but it's rather interesting and, and usually people attribute this notion of potentialities to heisenberg but actually it's there developed in quite detail in, in this, this book. But this is more just to give you a little bit of a characterization of what's going on in there, in that book. And the, uh, I, I, before I move on to discuss that 51 book, I just mentioned that of course, Bohm's other programs like the hidden variables and the implicate order, they are also potentially relevant to, to cognition. And that's what I, those I've discussed in, uh, in the book that was mentioned. But I won't be talking about those so much today. We can, if, if in the discussion, if people want, we can, we can also talk about them. But I thought I'll focus on this early, early part because it's probably not so familiar with the two people. So what are, where are those analogies? Uh, I think we could <coughs> label them as three where the first one has to do with uncertainty principle or, or some, some kind of incompatibility. The second one has to do with contextuality. And the third is something that I've called the quantum classical modes of thought. 
it's not some term that Bone was using, but it's a term that uh, is being used today in the literature. And I, I think it's fair enough to maybe it, it does give it a description. And just there are, here are some uh, quotations, uh, which is this kind of, if you like, a kind of an uncertainty principle for thought, at least in a qualitative sense. Uh, suppose that you are reflecting on a particle subject and you then somebody, okay, somebody can ask you a question, what are you thinking about? Or you might yourself be, has be more aware of what you are thinking. The idea here is that there'll, there will be this unpredictable and uncontrollable change in the way thought will proceed. It's kind of something of course known in, in, in introspection. I think, you know, psychologists like Tony Marshall describe these kind of things quite nicely. And of course, if, you know, from quantum mechanics, you know that if we measure the position of a quantum particle, we introduce this unpredictable and uncontrollable change to its momentum. This is kind of the typical situation. So here is the analogy. If we compare uh, the instantaneous state of a thought with the position of a particle and <clears throat> the general direction of change of that thought with the particle's momentum, there is a strong analogy. And here you could all maybe already say, for example, you, you might use a thing like this also to explain something like the order effects. But. And so, uh, so we could say that measurement in, in both in introspective psychological domain and in the quantum domain cannot necessarily be assumed to be a revelation of well-defined pre-existing properties. That's why Bohm, Bohm and Hailey have suggested we should use the word experiment for the things that we do in, in, in quantum mechanics rather than measurement. <laughs> and, you know, this, and also that those experiments are typically participatory rather than just passively revealing what what was there okay so uh now and then there's the second one second analogy here which we might then call contextuality uh, <clears throat> it's about an analyzing thoughts you try to break your thoughts into smaller and smaller or elements and you will come to a stage where you can't do that anymore. And the way you might think what's going on here is that somehow uh, <clears throat> the elements of your thoughts are, are connected to other, other elements in a, in a kind of indivisible way that there's, you can't just uh, separate, separate them as, um, as kind of a completely independent elements. And the same works with our words, that the, uh, again, the question is how much language is analyzable. And interestingly here, I, I just mentioned, given in some of the articles that, uh, I think Bohm here draws attention to the, these features in language and in later work people like Peter Bruce and Derek Arts they have really done detailed mathematical uh, uh, work to try to show some of these things that's what I find just very very interesting that uh, that the um, in a way how the thing has developed <clears throat> and of course I, don't, I think many times they are they've done that independently of Bohm I think many of them but in some ways I feel Bohm should be acknowledged for, for uh, anticipating e even this uh, line of research. But that's just like, you know, if you like, it's a footnote. Okay. Now, the analogy here is that, that again, and this is in the, uh, in, in the usual interpretation of quantum mechanics that we can say that uh, uh, whether we think of a quantum object that's more wave-like or particle-like would depend on, on, the, on the context and, and the kind of apparatus that it's interacting with, for example. I mean, some apparatus would bring out the momentum 
the wave-like uh, property and, and another one, if you have a position measuring uh, device, then the particle aspect will be explicated. But the idea is there that somehow it's the, it's the relations or the connections that are crucial for what the object is. And so, uh, again, uh, we can think that we have elements which have certain characteristic properties. So individual words have meanings or an individual quantum object would, can exhibit a wave or a particle nature. But the key point is that they have such properties partly in virtue of the relations they have with other elements. And if you change those relations, you may profoundly change the characteristic properties. So, uh, so the, um, <clears throat> so here's an example actually from Bohm's, uh, Bohm's uh, writing that an electron that just exhibits a wave-like property may suddenly exhibit a particle-like property if it is made to interact with an apparatus that measures its position. Now, there's something that I thought about here myself is that the philosopher Quine had this doctrine known as meaning holism. And what Quine would say that a statement that previously seemed false may suddenly seem true if we make drastic enough adjustments elsewhere in the theoretical system it belongs to. So Quine's text was published also in 1951, but it's just a coincidence. But this kind of whole is more contextuality, which also uh, in, in this so-called analytical philosophy has been recognized. And, and it has also, of course, significances on how we think about truth and our theories and how we test them and, and so on, and what kind of uh, consequences we can make from tests. This is sort of philosophy of science relevance also, because um, just by claiming that the statement is true, uh, you have to then also pay attention to the context or, or the theoretical system. Okay, so to summarize this, the above suggests that, that both thought and quantum phenomena are characteristic of a radical type of wholeness, unanalyzability, and context dependence. And so, uh, in some of the recent literature, Gabor and Arts have described this context dependence in generalized quantum terms, and, and then again, Brusa et al., they have explored meaning relations in terms of the quantum light constant of entanglement. So there's interesting uh, work being done in this, these topics. And the, um, let me see how we're doing with time. Maybe I'll take this third one and then afterward we can then maybe discuss a little bit, see. <clears throat> and this is, uh, the idea here is then that uh, you, something you might say that both uh, thought that there's this idea of a classical limit. So you could say there's a similarity between the logical aspect of thought process and the classical limit of the quantum theory. And connected to this, there's a similarity between what Bohm calls the knowledgeable basic thinking process and quantum processes. And here it's again, it's very interesting to see that one of arts has talked about these two modes of thought, which I think in some ways is very clearly also here, you can find in, in this Bohm's early work. Now, just a little bit of, about the classical limit, so what does it mean? Well, you could say that at the fundamental quantum level, movement seems discontinuous. People, you know, you talk about quantum jumps and, and in a more, if you like, in a more metaphorical way. But then again, they, there is a domain of physical phenomena where Newton's continuous and deterministic laws of motion provide an approximately correct description. And this has to do with uh, something known as the correspondence principle, which Niels Bohr developed, where the idea is that when you are constructing quantum mechanics, you must choose the laws 
so that in in this classical limit uh, where where many quanta are involved these quantum laws would lead to the classical equation as an average you put that as a re restriction when i mean or boarded when when actually developing the quantum theory and so uh and how do you re reconcile these two levels? Well, you just say that these quantum discontinuities are too small to be seen on a classical level. And also that there are so many of them that uh, these deviations of the results are negligible. But this is of course the kind of an early characterization. So I think today people might also describe these things differently. But, uh, but again, so, uh, let me see, yeah. In, you could say that quantum theory would emphasize the indivisible unity of the world, but in our everyday experience, we encounter the world that can be analyzed in the distinct elements. And this is world is what we call the classical world. So it looks as if we have the quantum world and the classical world. And I think here I'm jumping a little bit ahead to, to Bowman Hiley's 1993 where they bring out this nicely saying that it's not that there are these two separate worlds, but what we call the classical world is the sub world containing the overall quantum world. And they introduced this idea that this overall quantum world would observe itself with the help of its classical sub world. I, it's, I just mentioned that and I, if people want, you know, it's, you can find it in the, um, book Undivided Universe, it, but it's a very interesting way of looking at it because, uh, because we kind of need also the classical world to have any stability and if we want to have meter readings or pointers or rods and clocks and things like that, we, we might, we often make use of the classical world, but that's still not the fundamental world. So in, anyway, I'm here just advertising the is uh, if you want to learn more about these worlds, if you like. But anyway, we go back to the analogy. So what Bohm is saying here is, is that relation between the logical process to the more general type of thought process is analogous to the relation between the classical limit and the most general quantum process. So it's the, uh, perhaps it's in some ways a more, subtle analogy than the other ones, but but it's still a, a kind of the structure at both is, is analogous. And so, uh, <clears throat> so what he's saying is that there is this, when it comes, you know, this is like understanding, understanding thought, is that in, in our thought, there's a kind of general type of thought process in which wholeness prevails. So there are component ideas there, but they are not really separately existing elements with well-defined meanings. Again, the ideas do not necessarily transform according to rules of logic. They, he just says they flow steadily and indivisibly. And again, uh, he would say that it's a process, but not necessarily a process having an order and necessity characteristics of logical thought. So it's sort of a, it's an interesting view, view of the mind that Boehm is educating. It's in some ways, it's, you know, some people would say that it's a little bit postmodern or in, in philosophy there is, we have phenomenology. Of course, we have Immanuel Kant who had this very kind of, if you like a Newtonian view of human experience. But then there's phenomenology, which is still a little bit Kantian, but there's something known as post-phenomenology. People like uh, late Heidegger or, or Bataille or Patochka or Murray Ponty. And I think Bohm's view of the mind is somehow more in line with this post-phenomenology. I've mentioned that a little bit in the article that I gave the reference, but I just mentioned it here. The, um, uh, <clears throat> but again, okay, just as the physical world has a classically describable domain, so, so Bohm is proposing that the process of thought includes the domain of logical thought process. And, and so, uh, and in this sort of what we might call the classical limit of thought, we can then uh, neglect 
those more holistic and, and indeterminate uh, features for all practical purposes. So it, it's kind of a And that again makes the fact that if you know the fact that there is this more if you orderly and structured level of the mind means also that we can have these autonomous elements like concepts that classify objects and uh, and also interesting this is a tricky point here but that you can have these causal relationships there now you might where, where, where do we need causal relationships so you might say, well, even when you're thinking, if your thinking process is to follow the rules of logic, you may need to control those elements. And uh, in that sense, some sort of causality is, uh, is needed. It's of course, when we are talking and speaking, again, we have to make our words, uh, words put them in, in a particular kind of order. And it cannot be entirely quantum all the time or indeterminate or random or anything like that. We have actually have to be able to determine those, those words. And, and so uh, in this sense, logical thinking process possible. But of course the, law, causal, you know, the laws of logic are different from causal laws. But causality perhaps here makes logic possible as a feature of your thinking process. And perhaps just to, again here, maybe it's an obvious point, but still that, you know, even though Bohm would say that the basic thinking process is, is this quantum-like, he didn't deny the importance of the classical limit of thought. Just that, you know, you can't deny the importance of, of the classical limit of quantum theory. Because of course we, you know, logical thinking would be fundamental for science and thought in, in general. But I think the point here is that it would be a mistake to assume that logical thinking is the most general essence of the thought process. Just as it would be a mistake to assume that classical physics reflects the essential nature of the physical world. And I think what we here see is, is this kind of revolutionary potential of, of this, this idea of quantum cognition. Because there, the proposal here is that our thinking process would have this quantum-like aspect and even more strongly it's the basic most general type of thinking process would be quantum-like and, and this is again in some ways you one could raise the question whether all this work in quantum cognition that i mentioned whether they would agree with with this as well i so would ask why what so they do all this work with quantum probability and apply it on so what you know what then what <laughs> What, is there any 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 kind of more general meaning meaning coming out of it? And so uh, I think I'll, I'll soon come to a stop here. But uh, you say that, of course, this is very much in in this spirit of the standard quantum mechanics in terms of the complementarity comes here. Uh, say that the basic quantum thinking process has this complementarity in the sense that making one aspect of the process definite inevitably changes other equally significant aspects. That's the, that's the idea in, in uh, complementarity and uh, there's also the idea of this quantum-like wholeness because these characteristic properties of elements of thought would depend on these connections with other elements. And there's further the idea that, that the, uh, if we think of how thought changes from moment to moment, if there are these indivisible non-logical steps, that, that that's another other kind of, again, something that one could study more, even more, perhaps more empirically. I don't think, I don't know how much people would have explored this. And again, there is this classical limit, thinking in terms of well-defined concepts. So, uh, 
So I guess one of the things that I just want to say here is that this uh, Bohm suggests and anticipates, I would say quite profoundly, many of the current successes in quantum cognition. And, and, uh, and some, we could ask whether in these experimental results we are witnessing the outcomes of this human general thinking process, which is quantum-like and obeys quantum probability theory. And so uh, I, uh, I think there's a fairly strong case for arguing that some cognitive phenomena and some quantum phenomena are an analogous. And of course, then the question is why they are analogous. Is, is it just a coincidence or could there be a re deep reason? But I think I'll, I'll, I, I've gone quite a bit now. I could stop here and we could have some discussion and then, then we are, you know, if we discuss then we can have a little bit still to go, so. Sure, would you like uh, to do 10 minutes of discussion Q&A? Yeah, sure. Okay, fantastic. Um, I'll uh, just uh, stop your um, right. screen share if that's okay with you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as I said earlier, to ask a question, you just use the raise your hand function or physically raise your hand and if I spot you, I'll uh, give you your voice. Um, I can see Alan was ready to raise his hand. Yes, thank you. Um, that was truly thought provoking. I feel I need to go for a walk to actually properly appreciate um, all you said. And I hope this is not going to be a stupid question, but um, what did arise? And let me just say a background to this is over the last year, I've just been reading a little bit about evolution and feel that believing that it's all down to random mutations is just too improbable to be true. It may be a factor, but not the whole truth. And in terms of everything that you said about thought, it does seem to me that there is something called intelligence or a direction of thought, which is beyond anything which is beyond the random and beyond probability. Um, and I'm just wondering, in terms of what you said, does it help explain intelligence? Yeah, it's a good, good question. I think the, um, I think in that sense, maybe it's probably fairly implicit in that part of part of Bohm's writing. Maybe the, this idea of that when you when you have a sudden realization of <clears throat> of a new idea, I think that's where he, he would see that this is somehow reminiscent of, of some of these quantum processes. Maybe like the quant quantum jumps is of course in the popular literature that Fred Allen Wolf had this, I think the title of his book was Taking the Quantum Leap. And I don't know what he wanted, but maybe he wanted to communicate something like uh, the Kierkegaard, I don't know if that's the Kierkegaardian champ or, or some kind of a <laughs> whatever that, that means. But I, I think the uh, Bohm starts thinking about intelligence much more perhaps when he encounters uh, Krishnamurti. I think that's kind of addition to his uh, uh, discussion that uh, because, the, and then of course, then it, there's, it's maybe a little bit kind of transcendental view also. I think in the 50s, Bohm was still pretty much like a dialectical materialist, but I mean, you can, it's still, you know, there are no, I don't think there was any religious uh, uh, dimensions there. He was probably an, I don't know if you could say he was an atheist at the time or still trying to understand thought in terms of the material functioning of the brain, but bringing quantum mechanics into it. So in that sense, enriching the Con current, you know, the materialism of the times. But I think then once, you know, there is a change when he starts, of course, reading Hegel, but, you know, Gurdjieff and Krishnamurti, and I think then he's open to uh, intelligence, maybe in a sense that even beyond, uh, at least beyond sort of typical materialism, and uh, which, of course, some, you know, philosophers sometimes do that as well. I mean, you know, Hilary Putnam had this article saying, 
why reason cannot be naturalized. I mean, you know, they don't, uh, so, so it's not completely unheard of to, to move into that direction, even, even within um, philosophy. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Alan. Um, I believe uh, Chris, Chris Todd Hunter had a question for you. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I, I love the, uh, the way that the, uh, there's a jump, there's a sort of jump between uh, quantum probability and thought processes as if there's a, um, as if somehow they were linked together at some point. Um, but I'm interested in economics and there's been a lot of talk recently about radical uncertainty. Uh, you mentioned economics there and I was wondering if you could uh, enlarge on the uh, what what has been the conclusions drawn about economics? Well, I think in this, uh, I, I'm not that familiar with all the work, uh, but uh, I know there's this uh, uh, Russian physicist, Andrei Krenikov, he's based in Sweden at the moment. And I think he's, uh, his wife was an economist and, or, Maybe it's a previous wife by now. I don't, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how it worked. When, when but at, what they did is to actually apply the uh, the hidden variables theory, or you know the so or some people call it the pilot wave theory to economics. So they had this financial pilot wave. So they were trying to model economic processes through this Bohm Bohmian, or maybe even the Bohm highly formalist. So maybe they were using this idea of quantum potential there. I don't know how successful those uh, results were. Uh, there is another researcher, Emmanuel Haven, who has been doing uh, similar things. So I think they published, I think Kernico and Haven, they published a book called something like maybe Quantum Social Science with Cambridge University Press. I think that's the where I would look for. But I do not remember detailed uh, examples. However, I, I I do recall that there's a Nobel Prize in economics went to somebody who took the Hilbert space formalism into economics. I mean, was a kind of inspired quantum. This is probably not. I don't know if it had anything to do with with Bohm, but it's just an anecdotal uh, memory, which may even not be correct. But thank you. Thank you, Chris, for asking that. I uh, believe uh, Joy has a question for us. Joy, can you hear? Are you with us? Yeah. Hi. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so I was just thinking back to one of your later slides um, where it seems like there's um, a bit of, uh, I guess, astonishment that quantum theory and uh, the workings of the mind might have similarities. Maybe I misunderstood that. But, you know, it's like quantum mechanics was perceived by the human mind. So can we, I, it brings up the question is, um, can we ever perceive or be aware of anything that isn't somehow um, um, it comes out of mind. I'm going to say mind instead of brain because I think mind is larger, more holistic. Um, so to me, it would be surprising if we couldn't uh, find some analogies there. I was just uh, wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, that's yeah, that's interesting. It's of course the. Uh, uh, a very simple way of thinking about philosophy is that you know this that, that with the ancient Greeks they were perhaps concerned of finding the order of the world. So that was kind of a, quite an objective approach, and they weren't necessarily giving so much attention to to the subject. But of course, in uh, philosopher, philosophers think that the Tremendous change came with Immanuel Kant, 
for whom one of the main, you know, the main question for Kant is the way the human mind puts order to the world. Because no longer do we assume that the order is out there to be discovered by us, but it's more like the Kantian project is to try to study the human mind and the way it necessarily would shape any, any experience we have. So in a way, what, according to Kant, what we experience is, is uh, very much coming from us, ourselves, our own mind, the way, you know, and he, of course, he assumed that the principles of Newtonian physics like uh, causality and, and space-time are features of the human, you know, the, the forms of our perception and categories of our understanding. And Kant, of course, said that we do not know what the ding and see, what, what the reality, that's unknown to us. Yeah. So, of course, if we have a very Kantian approach and, and bring that into quantum mechanics, we could say in the same way that you know, we have no idea what uh, Ding and Zi is, but now we manage to somehow construct this uh, quantum view of the world, but presumably that has to come from our, you know, we just say Kant was wrong in, in the, that it was Newtonian, but maybe Kant was right that it's still us who is doing the construction. And, and that, that's then, you know, I'm just expanding on what you said, that perhaps in that way, it wouldn't be so surprising that there are these analogies, but 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 anyway. So uh, the other view is, of course, to say that we do uh, we can have a more objective view of of quantum mechanics. That was, of course, Bohm's view that uh, that, uh, that there is this. Uh, you know, we're studying quantum reality, but of course, he. I think he more and more. It's not that he became a Kantian, but I think Bohm understood the difficulty, the philosophical challenge over there. And, uh, and also they discussed that in the Undivided Universe in, in one of the chapters. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Joy. Um, Pavel, there are many people who still want to ask questions. Are you happy to take maybe one or two more? Sure. Okay, great. I believe uh, Shantina wanted to contribute. Um, yes, Pavel. Um, one, one theory that I've always found fascinating about the origin of thought is that thought starts as feeling tones and um, fuzzy, fuzzy um, perception um, response. And this circulates through the brain, uh, from the cortex to the, I don't know, the corpus callosum or um, some more emotional part of the brain, and then back again into the cortex. Uh, and this gets distillated in some way as in, into a, a conscious thought. Um, I'm curious about like this way of looking at things, could it be also read in terms of quantum thinking and the classical limit? Logic, um, exact logic being just a result of this process in which the primary material is emotional stuff. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. I, no, perhaps not so, uh, familiar with that, um, but there are, of course, some some research who I think one guy is called Mark Solms who would who would uh, emphasize this uh, role of uh, feeling and uh, affect very much as also for consciousness, and and so uh, so so in in the sense that at least when it comes to conscious. Uh, phenomena then you can't leave leave out those and and so uh but then how how thought would would kind of come into it i mean they would give examples like uh that cortex what what things in the cortex are mostly unconscious that some of you know whereas when it, when you go to the brainstem and feelings and you know the more primitive 
you do not, if you get damages into those parts, you will lose, lose consciousness. But then the question is, of course, whether that's just something that whether the, uh, whether the brainstem is only like the active, you know, it activates things. And, uh, but there's kind of still a debate where, where if you like, where, where consciousness would be, be located. And, and so, uh, but of course, this, this whole idea of where, where thought origin is, what's the level of mind? Is it so that there is this, uh, you know, this, I, I, I used to have a colleague, uh, pa Pauli Pülke, who talked a lot about the aconceptual experience, aconceptual mind, from which concepts would then originate. And maybe thought would, or, which is kind of similar to this idea that we have this more general thinking process. But I think the feeling, of course, in the implicate order view, Bohm would say that uh, we have, you know, thought and feeling. These are all different aspects of the of the mind, but they kind of enfold each other. So thoughts would typically uh, give rise to to feelings, and uh, perhaps even, you know, they could determine the kinds of feelings we have. If I have a good reason to be angry, if I think like that, then I will get angry. In the same way, emotions and feelings would give energy to your thoughts and and uh, and, and so the, it would be this one process where, where they are different aspects, which in some ways influence each other, but they're not at all independent. So in, in a way, I think that would be perhaps towards what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you, Santana. Um, is it okay if we take one more question, sure. Uh I believe John has had his hand up for a while now. John Knack? Yes. Uh, hi, Pavo. Um, I was wondering if um, if you knew if um, David Bohm had ever talked about the implications of these ideas um, on free will, um, or if not, just your thoughts on that. Well, I think he he does discuss free will. Uh, there's this book called Physics and the Ultimate Significance of Time. I I happen to have the book here, so I can show it to you. <laughs> And, and so uh, I think there, for some reason, the question of free will, the article itself, Bohm has this, it's a fairly technical, maybe one of his most deep articles in, in, in physics. But then in the appendix, they, the, the question of free will comes up. I think he says something that, that uh, we are not free to will the content of our, our will. So in, in some ways, the key point would be to maybe through some kind of meditation to become aware of, of the deeper layers of, of the mind. So he, I think he would refer to the implicate order that somehow you have to, have to uh, that the true freedom would come only through, through awareness. Whereas typically we are, we are not, when we are, well, when we are lacking awareness of our inner psychological uh, realities, then we are not likely to be very free. But uh, so I think that that would be be the uh, the kind of approach he he would take. Right. Um, thank you, John, for that great question. Um, uh, would you are you happy to take one more, Papa, or would you like to continue yeah. with your presentation? Oh, no. um, Andrew, Andrew and Yuriko had a question for you or a contribution. I'm unmuted, good. Okay, there you are. Um, th thank you. So I was expecting a lot of maths today and thank you for leaving that out. And it's been crystal clear so far, um, except I'm not, and this relates maybe to Shantana, I'm not entirely clear what you mean by thought or logical. And does thought embrace all forms of mental activity? I'm thinking of things like insight, emotion, dreams, and so on. And does logical mean, could, it, could we say instead coherent or self-consistent? So it's really just to clarify those two terms. Right. Well, it's a good, it's sometimes hard to tell from those because they are so short. The, the sections that I've been kind of using here, they're, they're short, but of course thought 
typically, of course, thought we 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 think maybe kind of verbal and also the like when I'm speaking, thinking the cognitive aspects, it, as opposed to uh, then then feeling feeling feelings and things like that. But of course, Bohm felt that they are not really separate. Like at least in his later later thinking, so he would say, feel that thinking and feeling is, is, if you like, one one process, which has these two aspects, and and which which in you know thought would inform feelings, feelings would give energy to thought, and so on and so forth. So, but I guess the way I'm using it here is limiting thought more to this more cognitive kind of. Uh, uh, conceptual processes, and and with logic, one one thinks there may be maybe this kind of uh, simple, maybe simple rules of predicate logic. Of course, there is something known as quantum logic, where you allow ch you're changing some things from so-called ordinary logic, which which some features which may seem like paradoxical and. Uh, but but I think what you said about coherence and self-consistency. I mean. I, I'm not using these in, in any very complicated sense, almost like in their common sense sense uh, terms. But uh, but there are some discussions. I think Bowman Wilkins talk about these things. Uh, it's kind of bio, biographical discussions. I think there are maybe available some American Institute of Physics somewhere. And I think there Bohm explains why he ended up focusing on thought so much. Like this is the thing with Hegel, but it's also with Christian Murdy when they, you know, the idea is that it's a thinking process that somehow also creating all the troubles. So, so I think there is a sense in which we should be, you know, we could be paying a lot of attention to our feelings or other things. But I, in some ways, I think the message is that we should really be paying attention to the way our thinking operates. Because that's the more the idea is that this is the more powerful thing. That's where our confusions arise. That's where it sustains our hatred. All the memory, you know, all the bad things that have happened to me, I have a cognitive memory of them. You know, I, I have a good reason to be angry at this person, and I'm insulted by that person. If I were just a, a more, if you like, a more primitive organism without language, I wouldn't be necessarily able to remember all those things. Uh, Bohm used to give the example of a dog that you know would be very you know when you saw the dog he'd be very angry and barking like hell, you push the when the dog goes round the corner it calms down because it cannot sustain the cognition of of the whatever it was <laughs> angry about. So I guess in that sense thought has a special role in 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 Bohm's um, thinking. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, thank you, Andrew, and it's uh, good to see you here. Um, yeah, I believe, uh, I think we're done with uh, questions. I don't see any raised hands, so uh, do you uh, want to continue? Yeah, sure. I, I'll go for a bit, but I guess I have to share my, can I share my screen now? Of course you can, yeah. Let me see, I, I'm so bad at this. I have to. So if I do this, I get this, I get that. Okay. So we ended up here that did some, uh, give some examples and reasons why it seems that this cognitive phenomena and some quantum phenomena are analogous. And, and we could still ask, well, how come, why is this? It's just a coincidence, or or is there is a reason? Well, you, you we saw people say, well, there's this analogy, but then again, well, where could it? And so, uh, Bohm himself, in, in he he would admit he said he writes, well, it could be just a coincidence. But then there's the alternative, which apparently Niels Bohr, but also Bohm, and also many you know many others after after them. It could that there's the alternative that the physical aspect of thought involves quantum processes in some important way. I mean, there's a trivial sense in which everything physical would in, involve quantum mechanics. But I think what one is here interested in in something you might call more subtle quantum effects or subtle as opposed to trivial 
that's the way the literature would would uh, put it and and so and you see the promise here or the possibility here is that if this were the case this this might explain in a qualitative way the analogies a written would explain but i mean uh, i think we might be even more put it a bit weaker and so <clears throat> so if we see suppose that the physical aspect of thought involved the quantum processes this might then explain qualitatively why the di direction of thought is disturbed by an attempt to define its its content and 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 so uh, because if here the idea is that the thinking is turning upon itself but but if somehow you would have those uh, uh, quantum properties involved in this uh, way we might come into an explanation in the same way with this uh, contextuality that the uh, question is whether one could use this these quantum processes to explain them and uh, and and the same thing with this uh, classical limit analogy that uh, uh, so we suppose we do have these a conceptual thoughts or or even a logical aspects in our thinking process that whether they they might literally involve quantum processes with with their properties and again then when when our thinking is more um, logical and conceptual then what what could underlie is this classically describable neural activation patterns. I mean, this is just very simple. Get started on this. And the uh, now, if this were the case, we might say almost that you know there's what we might call the quantum brain. That's a domain of brain where you would have these uh, non-trivial quantum effects. Operative. It could be people talk today about quantum coherence or oh, these kinds of various kinds of the Frelich biologist was uh, long ago already writing about possibilities of, of such things in quantum coherence in biological organisms. And then there might be what we might call this classical brain, which is where, where the uh, and the uh, Again, I'm just playing with the idea of this, and similarly with, with the quantum world and the classical world, and uh, whether we could say that the classical brain is a subbrain containing the overall quantum brain. This is a tricky point. It's difficult to even think about it. I, I was, that's why I put the question mark there, because I'm, but I just throw that in there as well. And whether we could say that this overall quantum brain would observe itself with the help of its classical subbrain that the, uh, which would be analogous to the way the overall quantum world would contain a classical sub world. So, um, but perhaps these are not necessarily to be taken too seriously, but it's more like just trying to think about some of these implications here. Now, in, the, in his 51 work, what Bohm does is to refer to Niels Bohr's suggestion. Apparently Niels Bohr thought that, was saying that thought involve such small amounts of energy that quantum theoretical limitations play an essential role in determining its character. Idea here being that you know quantum mechanics applies at very small small energies. And so uh, and that's when you get down to to the uh, small enough energies that that's when when the quantum mechanics is um, needed. And uh, now Bohm kind of acknowledges that there is the classical brain. So he says that the brain obviously involves classically describable mechanism that seems to act like a general system of communication. This is, of course, in 51. We, we know much more about the brain uh, today, but maybe this basic idea is still there. That, uh, so so he, Bohm acknowledges that there is a classical brain, and you know, he's not trying to explain everything in brain function through quantum mechanics, but allowing that you could do a you know, great deal could probably be explained without it. But but then the idea there was that what Niels Bohr 
is suggesting that there are certain key points controlling these mechanisms and, and, and which can be affected by the mechanism are so sensitive and delicately balanced that they must be described in an essentially quantum mechanical way. So uh, that's, if you like, that would be the quantum brain. And, and there's an idea there of, of this uh, uh, certain, certain kind of very sensitive uh, system, which could then also be, be uh, influenced by small energies. So, so the, uh, and he's saying that they might exist at certain types of nerve junctions. And much later, of course, uh, Friedrich Beck and Eccles made this kind of hypothesis where, where the, uh, uh, they were using, suggesting that the exocytosis could be governed by a quantum process. Exocytosis being the process where, where, where the presynaptic vesicles uh, release the um, <clears throat> chemi you know, chemicals to the synapse. Of course, later on, we have a Penrose and Amarov uh, speculating about the microtubules. Penrose's idea, you may, may remember, was that he felt that, that uh, to explain things like mathematical insight or the creative function of thought, uh, it cannot be computational. It has, there has to be a non-computable -com process. And if we feel that what happens in the mind must have at least a counterpart in the brain, then there have, therefore there have to be a non-computable physical processes in the brain. And he thought about various possibilities. You know, he could say that in general relativity, you might have some non-computational processes, but he still felt that the, that the measurement problem in quantum mechanics and, and, the, uh, and this uh, collapse of the wave function would be, then be a ca good candidate for, for this kind of, if you like, a quantum aspect of thought. Or, and the interesting thing with Penrose is that, that it, it also has to do with his feeling for general relativity. I actually, I was in, in January in, uh, in, in a small meeting in Tucson, and I, I, I was able to talk with Penrose quite a, quite a bit. And he was explaining, you know, some of these ideas, and uh, and and I think for him, because there's this big question about uh, how to bring together general relativity and quantum mechanics, and and pe what Penrose was saying that it seems to him that many most people are just believe that quantum mechanics will never change, but it's it's the general relativity that has to has to give, and and he, I think. One way of looking at this, his whole idea of, of this collapse of the wave function, it's a, it's a collapse that has to do with gravity. It's, it's almost like the channel, in that situation, general relativity would win over quantum mechanics. So it's the wave function that has to collapse to, to, uh, because of these general relativistic constraints. It's just, I just mentioned that as a little, uh, little example of it, but... Um, but in some ways, this, this idea is, uh, uh, there are various other proposals like that, but, uh, but the, um, the, the, I think the idea is that there could be an, an uh, interesting quantum process somewhere in the brain that could then be amplified and give classical results. I also mentioned that in, in uh, in the later work, when when Bohm and Hailey were examining the hidden variable theory, you know, where where the idea where you think of an electron as a as a particle guided by a new type of field, and and Bohm proposed this idea of active information, as and also said that this is like a proto mental quality. Um, it's another way of trying to say that somehow it's quantum mechanics that helps us to find place of mind in nature. Because with classical physics, we don't, we don't necessarily 
think of information as so fundamental, but, but if, if we would accept, you know, if, let's play with the idea, with the hypothesis of, of active information then. And actually I thought that what, one could even maybe put together these uh, Bohm, Bohm and uh, Penrose suggestions that if, of course, I know that Basil, Basil is not terribly convinced that there is a collapse of a wave function and so on and so forth, but if, but suppose that uh, Penrose would be correct. If you would combine these ideas of active information and this non-computational collapse, then you might, you would have two reasons to think that quantum mechanics brings something uh, relevant to mind because the active information as a proto-mental quality would be at the level of quantum mechanics and the collapse would give you something like creativity or insight or this is how Penrose saw this. So anyway, so the, uh, <clears throat> But maybe as a sober reminder also, Bohm himself writes, after saying all these things about uh, speculating about possible quantum sites in the brain, he says that it cannot be stated too strongly that we are now on exceedingly speculative grounds. And this is, of course, the way the scientific community still looks at the issue. You know, we do have many proposals for, for quantum mechanics, but uh, unfortunately, or, you know, I think a lot of, it's, it's still very controversial. And I, you know, I, I talk to people, some people who, for example, work at microtubules, which don't think this uh, proposal is, uh, is reasonable, but you know, the hammer off work and all that. So it's in some ways very, it's very difficult to, to know, but, uh, but then again, there are, are, a lot of experimental work that's being done. I think that's where also Stuart Hammer has been very good that he's inspired a lot of people to make studies. So it's not just just uh, stating the idea and staying with leaving it, but you know there are a lot of a lot of um, people are exploring these these ideas and uh, so I'm who knows maybe five ten years we 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 will be wiser on these things. Okay, I'll, I'm coming to the end of the slides. Uh, and this is something again that what Bohm was writing, which is which I think are these are pretty cool, cool ideas here. That suppose that this brain function would be quantum in some way. So he he would write like this. If the thought processes depend critically on quantum mechanical elements in the brain, then we could say that thought processes provide the same kind of direct experience of the effects of quantum theory that mus muscular forces provide for classical theory. And, and you see, uh, so he's saying that the pre-Galilean concept of force obtained from immediate experience with muscular forces were correct in general, and he's suggesting similarly that the behavior of our thought processes may perhaps reflect in an indirect way some of the quantum mechanical aspect of the matter of which we are composed. And this I think is a very, very cool thing, thing to say. That the, it has, to, it's, in, it's, it's, if you like, it's a deep epistemological point having to do with uh, theory, theory of knowledge and, and uh, Bernard Russell talked about, when he talks about knowledge, he says there is knowledge by description and knowledge by acquaintance. And, and so knowledge by description is, I guess, something, you know, you can read books and things like that. But some things we have knowledge because we are acquainted, di directly acquainted with them. And what Bohm is suggesting here is that, well, we are acquainted with our thought processes through our introspection just as we are acquainted our sense, sense perception of uh, what, what we perceive in the world. Because we, we can kind of introspect. And therefore, if this link would be there, we would actually have some sort of acquaintance of, of indirect in acquaintance of quantum, pro quantum theory or effects of quantum theory. 
and here is just what, what the uh, some some of these. Um, why is this so interesting? Well, remember that quantum effects are often thought to lie in a domain that is not at all accessible to us in ordinary experience. And as a consequence, it is assumed it's difficult for us to understand. I mean, some people, of course, say impossible. You know, people like to quote Richard Feynman, who says that I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. And of course, you know, Feynman knew David Bohm and he. He knew the bone theory and so on and so forth. So, but still, he that you know he felt like <laughs> there's something. And so, uh, again, people might say that we have no experience of quantum mechanics prior to scientific experiments that probe this domain. So maybe some physicists might, you know, in that sense, kind of understand it. But ordinary folks, no acquaintance at all. And so. Uh, so what Baum does is to turn this familiar story upside down. It might be the case that all of us are familiar with some quantum mechanical aspect of matter in virtue of being familiar with an important part of ourselves, namely our thought processes. Quantum effects which were supposed to lie in some mysterious domain that only physicists have access to may lie much closer to home than we thought. That if we are psychologically quantum theoretical beings, then just by being familiar with ourselves, we may be familiar with some quantum effects. I think that's. It. <clears throat> I don't know if that is the case, but I think it's it's just a very exciting uh, possibility and, and a fairly subtle point that that Bohm is making there. But anyway, so. Uh, it's been a historical, what I've said is really going back to some ideas. It's, it's like 70 years after the discussion. What we see today is this rapid proliferation of interesting research on quantum cognition, also quantum biology, quantum computation, quantum information, just name it. I mean, there's lots. And it used to be very fringe, but now it's in also in leading scientific journals. And, and maybe a point about that, I, I'm like I, I was in a conference with uh, Busemeyer and, and we talked about this thing and he said, the fact that you publish in a leading scientific journal doesn't mean that therefore everybody will accept the idea. But what he said was that 20 years ago, people would just be shaking their head and saying, no way, I mean, what, you're great. what are you doing? And why are you doing things like that? And what has changed is that people acknowledge that it's one of the options. It's one of, you know, this quantum cognition, it's one program that seems interesting. And, you know, it's now acknowledged as a possibility or as an alternative. So that has changed. It doesn't mean that you still find, it's probably still a fairly small group of people, but, but it's there. And a lot of, you know, people are working on it. And so, I think potentially it's a significant, there are significant implications. And uh, if one wants to end with a little of, you know, maybe emphasizing a little bit, we could say that there's a possibility of a revolution in our understanding of the mind and, and brain that might parallel that significance of the quantum revolution in physics. We're not there yet, but it, you know, who knows? Uh, we might get there. And one person who has really, uh, written about this whole program and this many different programs this is Alexander Wendt. Let me see if I've got his um, book here. Nope. No, I don't. Sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, his, he, his book is called Quantum Mind and Social Science. And he really for anybody who is really interested in this, these questions, I would highly recommend his book also because uh, I, I mean, I don't necessarily agree with, maybe I think like in his case, uh, for my taste, he takes collapse of the wave function to central role in, in the story, but he really goes through the whole, whole um, area, all the different approaches, including, you know, Basil and I have written some of these things. 
over the years, and he's he's actually read our articles and 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 reports them there, and so. So that's that's something that it's a book on also on Cambridge University Press. So it's a it's a very good uh, review. Came out to maybe I don't know five years ago. So anyway, so I think the this is that's enough for the presentation. And I, I think if you want, you know, you have more questions and want to discuss something, let's let's move on to that part. Great, uh, fantastic, Pavel. Thank you so much for that. Um, yes, I guess we're again uh, taking questions. I can see Yo Jonald, I think it's pronounced, has a question for you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yes. Uh, Jonald, Jonald, my name is. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Pavel. Um, how do you contextualize all this with respect to the current you know philosophy of mind preoccupation with the hard problem of consciousness well, it's an it's an analytical philosophical preoccupation and secondly uh, i just like to comment on uh, you discuss this relation between uh, uh, penrose uh, theory of the mind and the Bohmian theory i actually have a, a chapter on that what if we combined the or or uh, consciousness theory of ben, uh, Penrose and Hameroff with uh, with ben, uh, with Penrose, uh, you just have to replace the quantum collapse with with Bohmian potential. Actually, it's more straightforward. So the, the problem with uh, with uh, the Penrose Hameroff model is that it is an orchestrated collapse, objective collapse of the wave function. So uh, triggered by quantum gravity. So if it's an orchestrated collapse triggered by quantum gravity, then it shouldn't be, uh, it, it will be hard for you to, for you to analyze it. How will that turn out to be something that the mind does, for example, in, the, in having a creative thought? Because objective collapse of the wave function could really be random. And so uh, I think uh, Penrose knows uh, this shortcoming, so they, the answer that we, with this, uh, because Penrose is a, well, he thinks of mathematics as uh, platonic. He's a platonically minded mathematician. So he said, uh, if there's a platonic plane that exists, then possibly the objective collapse of the wave function takes its hue from that platonic plane. But anyway, that, that's, a, that's a thing that came up because how could you explain creativity with respect to objective collapse of a wave function across the microtubules in neurons. But with, with Bohmian uh, quantum potential, it's straightforward because you have wholeness triggering Bohmian collapse, uh, uh, giving rise the way, uh, to the to, to Bohmian potential. Anyway, uh, that, that's the thing that I included uh, in uh, the thesis that I made. Uh, but basically, uh, the, 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 uh, the question that I want you to answer is the first one. How do we contextualize all this uh, with David Chalmers' uh, hard problem of consciousness in uh, philosophy of mind uh, discussions. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> of course, in this, uh, in this 1951 work that I spoke, there's not that much discussion of conscious experience as such. But, uh, but we have also, of course, thought about it. And also, I think, what my mind might also add that uh, Bohm died in 19, 1992. And although he was writing a lot about mind and matter, this was still, you know, conscious experience was not yet so much discussed. I mean, it was to some extent, but but so in a, in a way, it, it, it's kind of a. It would have been, of course, interesting to to know more more about what Bohm himself would have said about that. But the one interesting connection is there that when David Chalmers, in his book *The Conscious Mind*, which is a very it's a very very good book, actually, where, where he does formulate the hard problem of consciousness. And then when he moves on to <clears throat> discuss a possible solution, he's then considering a double aspect theory of information. And he actually does credit, you know, mention Bohm as somebody who has approached the problem 
at least the mind matter problem through information. And maybe he mentions Bateson and some of the other people. And so what Chalmers is suggesting that, uh, firstly, that information is something fundamental in the universe, and then that it has always both a phenomenal, phenomenal physical aspect and a, or a physical implementation and a phenomenal, phenomenal aspect. And so what I, I've been doing, and also with, with, with Basil, we've been discussing and, and in, in some of the papers, our papers is whether you can bring that notion to the uh, bone theory and saying that this, what, what, what do you call active information in the bone theory, whether that could also at least in some situations have these phenomenal properties. So that would be a kind of a solution to the heart problem. But what we do, do need, of course, is a criterion that when does something non-conscious become conscious? And I don't think we, we've really done enough there. One of the theories that's currently very popular is the in integrated information theory of Tononi, uh, where they do have a sort of mathematical measure of, of consciousness. They call it this, this phi, this measure of integration. And uh, quite a lot of people have been working on that. But I still think this is something that I, I think I, I'm, uh, I'm going to actually suggest to Basil that we, we, should, uh, we should try to do more work on this, this, um, this part of the problem. That uh, I, I also, there, in this meeting that I mentioned where Penrose was in January, Tononi was also there. And I, I was actually able to discuss with him quite a, quite, for the first time for m many hours. And uh, he's very interesting in the sense that a lot of people may think that this integrated information theory is, is like a neural theory. But actually, it's not so much because what Tononi does is to start from consciousness. And he says that consciousness is the only thing that has intrinsic existence. So it's almost like, it almost sounds like idealism in the sense that, you know. And then what he does is to say that, so he starts by listing uh, features of consciousness. And then he asks, suppose I have a, let's say a physical system that is conscious, what must it be like in able to, to produce all these phenomenal features? And, and, uh, and, and then they do this theory. And, and, uh, and also I, you know, I tried, you know, we talked, I, I tried to ask Tononi, why doesn't he, what does he think of quantum mechanics? And he, he somehow doesn't feel quantum mechanics is, uh, so relevant here, but, but I think in actually that we could do perhaps more with, with a quantum approach than what Tononi can do. But then, but it, it, I think we have, would have to take things one, one step further from what we've done so far. Okay, I, just, I just need to add uh, something. Uh, yeah, yeah, I believe that yeah. Tononi has a sort of a, a weak, weak panpsychist assumptions behind integrated information theory. And it's more of a the testing is, well, that, that's, the, that's the foundation of his belief. So, and I think they, they tend, they want to test the back of the brain for, for that phi connection somehow. Uh, uh, my comment is uh, further on, on the Bohmian potential. I think the Bohmian potential will have a, a lot of impact on neuro quantum chemistry, on the on the oh. on quantum chemistry itself, be, because uh, because the Bohmian potential can initiate the release of neurochemicals in the in the neurons from a holistic uh, point of view. For example, when you see a, a tiger. Now you feel fear. Fear is, is, a, is a conceptual, human, uh, holistic uh, phenomenon. But how does that translate to the release of adrenaline in the body? If I looked at chemical literature and it doesn't bridge that fact. And I think the booming potential is in the best position to bridge that chemical, bridge, that, that quantum chemical bridge from the seeing of the tiger, the initiation of fear, the triggering of the booming potential, and then somehow through the neurons, the release 
of your chemicals that you know pave the way to the release of adrenaline in the body so i think uh, th there is uh, there is fertile ground in exploring that that uh, part of the that aspect of the boeing potential in neuroquantum mechanics anyway basil, basil do you want to comment on that uh, well in, in fact that's one of the most reassuring things i've heard for a long time thank you because we, if you remember, were actually looking at the Beck Eccles idea. And I felt that was just one possible way in. The difficulty is it's, we didn't spend enough time really discussing it properly because we need a lot more information about the functioning of the neural system in order to do that. I think we have it now. because I seem to remember when we were doing it, it was some time ago, wasn't it? Can you remember the actual uh, five years, 10 years ago? Which, Back which in was two, well, we did it 2005. 2005, yeah. okay. Well, there you go. It's a long time ago. Um, now, can I say something else while sure. I have the microphone? Firstly, I'm very unhappy about the Penrose idea of the collapse of the wave function. First of all, I don't believe that there is a wave function. A wave function was constructed as part of an algorithm for helping us do calculations when we're in the laboratory and we can do them very quickly. But if you actually analyze it, you get in, in a philosophical sense, you get into a terrible mess. Now, what I have been tracing back is that in fact, um, von Neumann way, way back didn't use the wave function at all. In fact, he actually said that he had given up hope and he thought the wave function was very misleading. And I tend to agree with him on that. And there are other ways which are coming out in what is known as algebraic quantum mechanics. The guy, uh, Rudolf Haag, has got a very nice account of this. And it's beginning to bring in the chemistry which the previous question, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name, was, was talking about. So John there is a, Sorry? Uh, John Alves. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but there is a way of bringing quantum mechanics into the fundamental quantum mechanics into the quantum domain in this way. And I would rather do that than to actually go in the brain and think it's the collapse of the wave function. I think another possibility might be that the breakdown in linearity certainly will come from general relativity. Mm -hmm. But I can't develop that here. If someone wants to talk about it, I can talk about it later. Okay. I've got some ideas on that. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Basil, for that. And uh, thank you, Jono, for your uh, contribution. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to uh, ask a question or contribute to the Oh, yes, it's Eddie. There you go. Sorry. Oh, hold on. You're still muted. Muted me? There we go. Yes. Thank you, Pavel. I mean, there's a lot I don't intellectually understand, but I have the feeling you are very creatively stimulating my quantum neurons somewhere. But the question I was wondering about was, with regard to the fact that a lot of physicists and even philosophers appear to have the belief that brain physiology will explain the totality of consciousness. And what I was wondering was with the quantum theory and quantum cognition and the work you're doing, is that tending to move the direction in that direction or is it tending to question that belief of brain physiology being ultimately able to explain the totality of consciousness <clears throat> it's a good good question i think the um, people who do this modeling you know when they're using this quantum probability as a modeling i mean they say they don't worry so much about uh, the brain it's a bit same thing in standard cognitive science when people make these 
you know, they can do artificial neural networks. They are more trying to just model uh, things like learning, le learning a language or other cognitive processes. But I think the, I guess with this quantum approach is, the, the issue is whether the explanation in terms of uh, the brain will be mechanical or something more holistic, whether it might involve some of new kinds of properties. So, so the, uh, I think that's what people are maybe, maybe looking, looking there. Whether, but I, I guess, of course, if you think of Bohm when he, you know, introduced this notion of an impl implicate order and an explicate order. So there again, one might say that the brain, what we, you know, what we call the brain is, is you know, there are a lot of structures and, and processes that take place in the explicate order of, of space time. But of course, the, the underlying idea is that, that there's this other more implicit ground. And, and of course, in such an approach, you are not trying to explain everything in terms of the explicate order, but you're acknowledging that there is this, there is also this more implicate domain. And, and I suppose that would take you away from just a very reductionist explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie, for that. Um, is there anyone else who would like to ask a question? Just uh, raise your hand on as the Zoom function or even physically. I have a question. Yes. Hello. My name is Ferrand. I'm in Geneva. Um, I would like to ask Pavel uh, if he knows if some mathematicians have tried to find out about math mathematical spaces for thoughts. I didn't find it in, in the net. That's a very good. Uh, that's a very good question. You know, there are these conceptual spaces. I think people would call them. Uh, in Sweden, there's this guy Peter Jadenfors, and there are other people like like that. Uh, I can I can type it to the. Uh, uh, to the. So there are these ideas trying to formalize uh, these things. And, uh, and I could also say that I, I sometimes very recently been involved with some, some uh, American grant agencies. And, and uh, one gets an idea also the sort of work people are, are doing. I think there are quite a lot of people who now want to apply uh, uh, mathematics, mathematical models to, to consciousness. There are people in Oxford University actually, not only Penrose, but also other, other people who are doing that. Part of it has, would have to do with this uh, integrated information theory, but that's not necessarily directly your question, which is about uh, modeling thoughts, but maybe Maybe Basil would have some ideas about that. I mean, you you may think you historically you would connect to Hamilton and Clifford and yeah, historic certainly historically, what got me interested in, in this was in fact reading what Hamilton and Grassman were saying about mathematics. They were saying mathematics is about thought. It's about ordering thought, order discussing orders. It's not about material reality. And when I first came across that, I found that very mind blowing. And that was a long, long time ago. And, and Grassman believed that he was actually trying to develop his, we, we use now, just let me explain to the people who are not mathematicians, Grassman contributed to the foundations of quantum mechanics, uh, but to the foundations of mathematics and introduced a thing called a uh, Grassmann algebra. And it's the Grassmann algebra that we have taken, but we have left behind all the ideas of where he got this from, what he was thinking about, why he was saying 
we should be thinking about thought and not about material processes. Well, that seems to have been forgotten completely. But it's interesting that Pavo is suggesting that perhaps people are now returning to that by looking at trying to understand the ideas of thought in a more mathematical way. David and I, David Bohm and I, were thinking about it in terms of describing it as algebras. And in that book that Pavo miraculously pulled off his shelves, in there you will see the discussion of the algebraic approach as Dave saw it. So I, I think we need it's encouraging to find that people are beginning to say maybe we ought to have more mathematical models of thought. There is also the category theory, which I think, Basil, you, you've been following that word with Bob Koek and or how do you yes. his name? That's another. And I think some people are discussing also uh, topology these days. Yes, well, I, I've, got a, I, I've got a very interesting quote from Ed Nelson. He was a, a, a scholar at uh, the Advanced Study Institute. And he says, quantum mechanics is a mystery, but second quantization is a functor, a functor being what is discussed in category theory. So whether that is any use to you, Pavel, I don't know. But he was a wag, Ed, as you know. Remember what he said about you philosophers? You don't it's even waste need to waste oh, I see. it was him. Oh my god. <laughs> he didn't say uh... sorry. <laughs> oh that's good. But he was a stochastic uh, stochastic quantum mechanic, right? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. E. C. Zeman uh, did uh, some uh, topology of the brain, it's topology of the thoughts. It's a good uh, mathematician, uh, an English mathematician, Zeman. Yeah, yeah. But can I come in, Peter? Of course. Can I come in? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. That's a very good point. What I was very impressed with was not so much Zeman, uh, but, oh God, what was the, the French structural stability? Rene Tom. I thought his work on structural stability was really first class, and I think it's better than Zeeman. Zeeman applied the catastrophe theory to prison riots, sociolo sociology problems, and so on. But it was really, um, Z uh, sorry, it was really uh, Rene Tom who actually had this idea <coughs> of structural stability and the invariants that, re that in come into the mind are structurally stable things. In other words, this, this mind juggling underneath it, trying to create something, the structure stability automatically holds the ideas. And that seemed to me a way of going forward. And it's a pity that work was actually dropped. But thank you for reminding me of that work. You're welcome. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Florian, and thank you, Basil, for uh, stepping in. Um, is there anyone else that might ask a question to Pavel? Yes, Beth. I have a question, and I feel silly asking it because there's so many brilliant physicists and mathematicians here. Uh, I'm not one of those. So I'm thinking about how complex David Bohm was. And here he has this capacity to speak to those of you who have that vast intellectual learning and skill. And then he also spoke to people who were just us common people. And he spoke with artists with great capacity. I mean, he could, I think about the, the, the <coughs> work that you put together, Pavo, and, and the letters with Biederman and all. So here's this person who speaks at so many levels of humanity and in so many fields and communicates like that. 
Uh, one time I was thinking about his use of the term canonical transformation, and I'm just using it I'm, metaphorically, but I'm thinking, is there, what was at the core of all this that allowed him to be so eloquent and so empathic and so capable of sharing messages in so many different ways? Is, is there a common uh, message at the at the core that was the invariant? Or are these all just separate proclivities that he had? That's an, that's an interesting, interesting question because uh, there was actually recently an article by Marie von Strien uh, about uh, the Bohm's thinking where I think she's suggesting that there's a kind of continuity of those different parts of uh, Bohm's work, partly, you know, in physics, but perhaps also in philosophy. And I guess the other w way would be to emphasize the changes. So perhaps something that I, I tend to maybe thinking more into those terms that in the um, that in the uh, in the 50s that he's still like was mentioning that he was interested in this uh, dialectical materialism and uh, wasn't terribly interested in religion as far as we know he made fun of uh, eddington's idealism in his letters and so on and so forth but somehow then th there are these changes that he he somehow then turns like he said in the film that also that he he began to feel that that uh, science will not solve all the problems and or it will not make humanity happy so uh, so the uh, so i think that was the um, that was his sort of a, a change but also, of course, this thing that he was explore, he would explore with artists and talk with, uh, you know, he of course with Christian Morty he had this very long and close uh, uh, relationship, which also then had, of course, it, it you know it wasn't always always easy to to uh, some of these explorations. I I think when I you know of course I I knew him. I, I guess I met first time met him was 1980 and then got to know a bit better perhaps 84 85 and, and so on and so forth I think at those stage it was clear that he he felt that this dialogue was was sort of very very important as 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 a way of I think also like solving the problems I think what maybe what you know what what he was seeking in uh, in Christian Murti was this kind of transformation of consciousness. The idea being that if we want, you know, want to make the world a better place, then we have to change inwardly. There's got to be a new, new kind of consciousness. But I think he also felt that somehow it wasn't quite working. All the work they've done and all the discussions and all that, 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 that somehow there. I think that's where the dialogue partly came in. That. Uh, that we something more is is needing it in that sense, and and perhaps this kind of communication communication would be needed, and that's why he started doing all those things. I think it, it was also it wasn't so much mentioned in the film. I did actually mention it to Paul Paul Howard, then, but there were you know he he admitted that there could have been more dialogue, but then you know the film had its limitations and. Uh, but I felt that this was somehow also very much Bohm's own discovery where he kind of put his money in the end. That, that he felt this, you know, the dialogue is, is, is the sort of thing that we really need. Of course, we need it in science, but we need it in, in society. So, for example, it's not enough that we have one enlightened person that nobody understands, which was a bit, you know, the kind of situation with, with Krishnamurti. How do we know even that the person is enlightened? You know, Paul was asking those kinds of questions. And if we are not ourselves and so on and so forth, we, we need a kind of different kind of uh, uh, approach. And and, uh, and that's, I think it, it would be part of, part of the legacy. 
and of course the dialogue is kind of natural that then you're open to to talking talking with everybody basically great uh well thank you for that uh basil uh, basil you wanted to add something yeah because i i knew bohm earlier I, I knew him from the 60s and I don't think can I, I don't think anybody can answer why he was so brilliant. We used to be discussing with myself and a student at some point. He would come in, he'd take his glasses off and he'd say, What's the problem? And then we would explain it and he would suddenly take the whole discussion onto a different level. And I have tried to find out how to do that, and I failed. It, it's just something special that he had. But it took a lot of hard work to get special, and a lot of talking to get special like that. But he had this ability of, uh, of raising to a very different level from most of us. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that, Basil. Um, Sorry, no, thank you. But uh, Chrissy is trying to ask a question. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Chrissy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, um, James. May I come in with a question? Yes, of course. Of yeah. Course. Thanks. Great. Um, thanks very much, Pavel. Also, Basel, and I'm connecting to this uh, field of dialogue. Beth, thank you for opening that up. Pavel, I have always asked myself of the role that Hegel played for David Bohm. I'm not a philosopher, but I have a hunch and hypotheses and Basel and also Shantena and others in this summer school kind of um, encouraged me to think that way. I have, I have the hypothesis that the aspects of Hegel, like process, like motion, like uh, the whole, um, the truth is in the whole, and um, holding the opposite, that this has been a very important um, aspects for David Bohm. I would even say, not only in physics, but throughout his whole life. And as you just touched on it, also in the, his later years for dialogue, which we also learned yesterday with David Moody, that holding the opposite, which I see also as, a, as an idea of Hegel, that he, uh, create, David Bohm created uh, the concept of dialogue to really put this into practice. So in a way, a dial, dialectic way of communication. So. Um, here in Germany, I'm in Munich, uh, um, people are, are very interested in Hegel, a new interest in Hegel. This year would be his 250th birthday. I was very uh, struck by the fact that Die Zeit, uh, a well-known um, weekly newspaper, put it on the first page this week, Hegel. So uh, I would be very interested in your views on that. Thank you. Yeah, again, I think uh, I think where Bohm discusses this is in those later discussions with Will, Morris Wilkins. They talk about Hegel to some extent, at least there. And and so uh, and uh, there are actually probably some some discussion. I haven't even read all those the, those discussions. I'm I remember Bohm telling me that I I should read Hegel's Logic. That's a part of the book that he. He didn't, yeah. and then he said he didn't like the phenomenology of mind so much, which people typically like. So I told that to my philosophy professor, and he was just puzzled because not many people really like the logic. And I'm actually reading myself logic at the moment. It was translated into Finnish a few years ago, and I, I like reading classics in my native language. Somehow, I, you know, get a different feel. I read actually through one's logic. I didn't. I felt I didn't understand anything. And I'm reading the second time and I gradually feel some of this so frustrating because he, he says something and then he says the opposite. And you know, it's, it's the, 
it, it's terrible. I mean, some some of it, and some, but at times it's really very interesting. I, I haven't. I'm I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna read it the second time, and then I make up my mind if I can. Uh, but by the time you get to the end, you've forgotten what was in the beginning, and so <laughs> so useless. But but I but I thought about it. I I also think the um, when we had this uh, discussion after the film with where Harold Atmaspaher said. He he said that the way he felt was that he said actually that dialogue was a way of trying to go beyond dialectic. But that's the way he's interpreted uh, Bohm. And and uh, but I think of course what Bohm said that our ordinary communication is discussion, which is come has the same root as percussion. So it's going back and forth. It's the thing about arguments and and. Uh, maybe trying to convince other people it can be about rhetorics and and uh, think that so that sort of things and uh, whereas i think he, what he felt was that as we know i mean many people if you're familiar with the idea for dialogue the the idea there was may, being aware of meanings and suspending our judgments and see what happens i think that was the key idea that and suppose you have this 20 people in a group, 30 people, those people meet regularly. If everybody actually was able to understand the meanings, at least, of course, everybody understands in their own way. So it won't be exactly the intended meaning. But still, if you were able to hold those meanings, suspend your judgment, I think he felt that this could give rise to some kind of new course, you might think of it as a Hegelian synthesis if, the, you, if you, there would be like a thesis and this is a structure there. But, but it could also be just a kind of an emergence of, of, of something new. So, so that, of course, he was very interested in that and did all those experiments. I used to go to quite many of those seminars and I thought they were really, sometimes they were really interesting things happened, happened there. And you know, I know a lot of people are doing this in different parts of the world, but but I think there's still a lot to explore there with this um, with this dialogue. That somehow that was his sort of a, a kind of discovery that became very important to him in the maybe somewhere like mid '80s or so. I'd like to speak, if I may. Yes, I was uh, sure. just about to see if that was okay, taking one more question. Yeah, sure. I know yeah. we're in overtime, but yeah, yeah. and Zanita. Yeah, sure. um, I'm Angelita, and I um, wanted to share that 20 years ago before in Tucson, before the Center for Consciousness Study was established, um, Hamroff and Chalmers and other scientists from many disciplines held salons. And um, I'm a native scientist. I hold native science in my, um, my way of thinking and practice, and I had an equal seat at the table. And I think that um, those of you that heard Leroy Little Bear uh, when he spoke, and he said, you know, those of us that come from a way of thinking that holds paradox as a way of processing information, this is not Hegelian, but Again, we have a common language. There are a lot of common bridging concepts between the way indigenous people and um, those of us that are creating worlds now in a quantum way that fits most with David Bohm's implicate and explicate order. We're here, as Leroy said, waiting in the, the wings um, to be in dialogue especially about our relationship with Mother Earth and with um, wellness and wholeness and um, what that means in this worldwide web that we're all connected in now. And um, there were dialogues that I think Lee Nichols will speak about when he uh, presents that between native scientists and quantum scientists, um, and we met for three or four days every year in Sacramento, oh no, in um, Albuquerque, every August in Albuquerque for, I was there for 10 years. And we took on uh, concepts like 
non-locality. And that's where we started. And then we began to share from our own perspectives and our own thinking in a quantum Bohmian scientific dialogue way, which required us all to release our basic tacit infrastructures and listen to each other deeply. And what I can say is information emerges. We are smarter, we are um, more harmonious as the days, as the hours go on and as we really truly listen to each other and, and contribute. So I just want to be a witness to um, Chalmers and Hammerhoff and all the crazy conversations we had and that I was a voice at that table and it works. So if you have people who are native scientists in your locations or if you're interested in, <clears throat> in that kind of a conversation, I think we have a lot to learn from each other. And um, I'm very grateful for this conversation today. It's been amazing. I love it. I have um, been inspired that I can be here and it's okay to be with all you Europeans. <laughs> uh, thank, you, well, thank you, Basil. Thank you so thank much, Angelita. Angeli so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, no, unfortunately, I do have to um, close the session just because we're in way over time. Pavel, would you like to say something just to uh, finish off? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, thanks very much. It, it's a uh, good, uh, good discussion. And uh, of course, there's, um, how do you put it? I mean, there's a lot, lots, uh, there's lots of work to be done. This is, of course, the frustrating part that when one goes reviews and, uh, and it, it and the, it, it's difficult to see how to move in this area. Like if we really, for example, to make more mathematical models of, of, of mind and, and consciousness. So, and unfortunately I'm not the one, one to make it. So I have to really talk to Basil, <laughs> other, other people who are more, more mathematical in that sense, because in some ways we, we need to go, go also uh, further with this, but there are, I, I, it's quite optimistic in the sense that uh, that there still is, uh, for example, there's something in, uh, in in states called the Foundational Questions Institute (FQXI), which is funded by the Templeton, and sometimes also by by Fetzer. They do things together, so I, I can see that there is a group of people uh, doing research on these kinds of uh, questions. So. And, and also here at the University of Helsinki, we are we are starting some new projects. So I don't know if you know it's too early to say if anything will will will, will come. But but there are some uh, anyway. There's some uh, activity in this area, and uh, and so perhaps we you know connect in connect in uh, these similar meetings in in the future, and maybe even with some new results. Who knows? But anyway, I thank you for my part. Oh, thank you so much, Pavel, for being part of our series. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And I really do apologize for all those people who wanted to contribute and ask questions, but weren't able. Um, now, just uh, before we just finish the, the session, I do have a couple of announcements to make. Um, first of all, I would like to invite you all to next week's session. Um, on uh, Saturday, we have a session with Beth Macy, who is here with us who will give a talk entitled Tracing the Story of David Bohm and Dialogue. And on Sunday, we will have Lee Nicol, who will give a talk uh, called Beyond Dialogue. As these two sessions revolve around the same theme, which is dialogue, uh, we have decided to send you the PDF of the latest issue of the Power Center Journal uh, called The Party Perspective, which is already available to our members. Uh, this issue focuses on communication, uh, and it has several articles on dialogue. So we invite you all to get the uh, journal and have a read, in particular, those essays on dialogue, so we can enter next week's session with a sort of a common ground. Um, I would also like to announce, uh, again, I mentioned it yes yesterday, but um, after much request, we have now started a... Um, a platform uh, discussion forum um, where, called Sutra. Um, with this, we will be able to keep the discussions going from these sessions, explore related topics, and ask questions and clarify some points made in the presentations. 
between participants and speakers. If you haven't received an invitation to join this discussion forum, please let us know by contacting us. Um, also, I have heard uh, a couple of people come up to us saying they didn't really understand how this platform works. So um, if you're up for it, I'm willing to uh, stay five, 10 minutes extra here in uh, this session. I can sort of give you a bit of a walkthrough, a run through of how that forum works. Um, is the, no, uh, yes, to contact us, uh, whether it's about Sutra or any other queries of any nature regarding the series or the center, uh, you can contact us by the website. There's a contact us page or just send us an email um, with uh, our email addresses. Mine is james at paricenter.com or eleanor's at eleanor at paricenter.com. Thank you again for joining us. And we'll see you again soon here at the Par Center. Thank you, James. Thanks. And I said, just said to Basil, I'll be in touch early next week if it's okay. Yeah, sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, yes, if you want to um, have a bit of a help for that sutra, just uh, stay online and uh, whoever's left, I'll uh, help them with the forum. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. really great to see you. Wonderful to see you. Great. Yeah. Hi there. Hey. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.